Oh, we're live? Okay, well, welcome everybody to Friday night at the Refuge Center. No. That's what I thought, because you guys were for a minute. It was pretty sad there for a minute. All right, well, anyways, uh, we're going to pray, open it up, and I'm going to invite our overseer that we've been praying for a long time about, Ellie, up, and she, we're going to pray for her, and she's going to give her testimony, because um, there's no worship tonight, so we're going to worship God through a different way, through through uh, the testimony of uh, the work that he's done through her lives. And if there's anybody else who would like to share a testimony, you may, as long as you don't do it like Michael did and cuss. So, all right. Hi, Michael. So, all right, let's go before the Lord. Lord, we come before you, and once again, we are just so thankful that you allow us to gather together here, Lord. We thank you for just the opportunity once again to uh, hear from your word and uh, God, we just pray that you would be glorified through this night. Lord, we pray that um, just as uh, not only do we come here to feed the community physically, Lord, but now that we would feed them spiritually. So, Lord, we ask that you'd give uh, Pastor Tyson uh, your words to speak. And, Lord, we ask that the Spirit would just fall upon this place. So, God, we just uh, thank you for all that you're doing amongst the um, the ministry of U-Turn and uh, Calvary Chapel. And God, I pray that you would just be glorified in all that we say and do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'd like to introduce you guys to Eliane. Come on up. Hi. Um, let's pray. Oh, Lord, I... I just thank you so much for this place, uh, for the opportunity to serve um, women. Uh, I just want to pray a blessing over the women's home. And uh, for my testimony, I just ask that you get me out of the way and speak what you would like me to speak uh, for these people. Lord, you know what they need to hear, so just get me out of the way. And um, just pray for a blessing over tonight, over the word. Um, we love you so much, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. All right. Um, I'm super unprepared. I didn't know until like five minutes ago that I was even going to share. So um, I'll start with my life first and then kind of wing it. Um, my life first is Matthew 16, verses 24 to 26. Um, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Um, and these verses have been um, really dear to my heart ever since I came to the Lord about two years ago. Um, I came into U-Turn, Pennsylvania a year and a half ago into first phase and went through the program. Um, but so I guess I'll just start kind of go through like vaguely my testimony. Um, I grew up in central Pennsylvania, uh, went to college in Florida. I got married. I had five kids throughout college. And then I went to school after I went to med school after college, um, and had kids throughout that time. I graduated and got into my residency. Um, we had this great where um, we just looked like amazing to the community. I was a super mom um, uh, and I couldn't really keep up uh, with just residency and with my kids and I started taking pain meds um, to keep up. I would be up all night cleaning and taking care of what needed to be done for the kids and um, on the outside, my life looked really great to the world, but on the inside, we were totally falling apart. Um, I was addicted to pain pills. Um, there was just a lot of adultery, um, sin in that way, and um, the hypocrisy of uh, just trying to put on, keep up appearances on the outside and um, behind the scenes, everything was falling apart. And the further it got from what people thought we were and what we really were, um, I just kind of broke down. I got to a place of, um, I was suicidal. I was really depressed. Um, and I couldn't get my pain meds anymore. So I turned to heroin. 
And um, at that time, my mom was sick, my dad passed away, just a whole lot of stuff going on. I ended up getting divorced. And in that time, I was like, just uh, suicide attempts back to back. And um, it just things got really dark for me. I had no hope. Um, I ended up leaving because I didn't want my kids to see me like that. And um, shortly after that, became homeless in Camden, New Jersey, which is a really bad place to be homeless or just a really bad place in general. I um, was on the streets for a while, uh, ran around the country just for about three to four years, just total like debauchery. Um, I'm sure some of you guys can kind of relate to that type of life. Um, a lot of hopelessness, a lot of sleeping under bridges in the snow, a lot of um, just not wanting to, like no hope at all. So um, I was out on the streets and there was a church that came and kind of evangelized and spoke to people to bring them into programs. And I met a lady and through that, she got me into a program. Um, I was saved at that program and I was there for about two months, but I ended up leaving and relapsing for about another year. I continued to get high. And um, after that is when I went to U-turn in Pennsylvania. And I just got to a place where I was like, Lord, this can't be all that you have for me. And I was on my knees in a hotel room, just like praying. And within like five days, I was detoxed and headed to you turn Pennsylvania and um, just the Lord is so good. Um, he is so good. I, um, I was just so broken and so, uh, so ready to just like, I was at a place where I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I need someone to tell me what to do. I need the word. I need, I just need Jesus in my life. And, um, yeah, so I went through first phase, went through second phase, went, um, did an internship at the church uh, that we go to our Calvary there. And um, yeah, the Lord's been so good. He's been so gracious. I um, am still at a place where I have no idea what I'm doing. I've been telling Linda, I'm like, I'm going to ask you for everything because I have no idea what I'm doing. I really need Jesus. I need accountability. I need um, I need authority. Um and, you know, so the Lord has done a work in my life. He's delivered me from the cravings of um, desiring to be high. He's delivered me from insanity. I was, like, completely nuts at one point, just, like, completely nuts. Um, the desire for the chaos, like, I just wanted to just, I just needed chaos. It was crazy. So um, he's really delivered me from a lot of things. He's restored a lot of relationships. Um, he also has not restored some. I'm still waiting to talk to my kids. It's been five years. So um, just something that I've been continuing to pray about. Um, and But yeah, the Lord is really good. So I was kind of praying about what the Lord wanted me to do. And he... Um, he gave me three words that um, that was the beginning of my praying to just like to figure out what he had for me as far as a calling and they're encourage, teach and restore. And um, so praying through that, I got um, women's ministry and children's ministry and um, and then a few different opportunities for different locations came up as far as going into leadership and U-turns and Oregon. The Lord just kept putting Oregon on my heart. And when someone first asked me, like, oh, will you go to Oregon? I was like, yeah, right. And um, yeah, he definitely like was was very faithful to show me. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think that's it. God is good. I'm, I'm actually here. It was, it was really, I don't know, like the warfare was really crazy the last month. Just a lot of like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I like, I'm like, my kids are in Jersey and I'm going across the country. And, but I know that the Lord wants me here. It's been confirmed through like five or six different pastors. And, um, I'm just blessed to be here to serve. I just want to serve the women. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have. I don't <laughs> Why don't you come up and uh, pray? I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dear Lord, we just love you so, so much, God. I just thank you so much for Ellie and her heart to serve you and to just honor you and all she does, God. I thank you for just for bringing her from all of the muck and the yuck and just making her life so beautiful, 
in you, Father. So I just pray right now, God, as you just lead her and guide her and help to raise up these women and help lives to be restored, God. I just pray, Father, right now that you'll give her strength. And I know that when she's weak, um, your strength so and we can glorify you, God. So I just pray right now, Father, that you'll just um, give her strength, give her energy. And again, Lord, when she feels weak, you'll be her strength, Lord. Mm -hmm. And I just pray that you'll help us all to make wise decisions. And as you prepare the hearts of the ladies that are going to come here, God, and relationships are going to build. And I'm excited, God. So I just pray right now, Father, that um, you'll just give her, again, strength and energy, Lord. And, and I love you and thank you and praise you just for all that you do in the lives of the men here and our church family. And oh, I can go on and on, God. I love you so much. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. All right, is there, is there anybody else who feels led to do their testimony? Want to give their testimony? You want to give your testimony? Come on. I, just, I think uh, going to U-Turn was cool. It can change someone's life, change my life, as long as, long as you take it into account. And, uh, yeah, I just, I mean, stop doing drugs. That's the whole thing. Like, I mean, drugs seem like a good idea, and then kind of veer off into this little zigzag pattern where, like, there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. And if, if you don't do, like, the good stuff, then it's all down in that one path of drugs and it gets really bad so you just have to keep your mind occupied with the good stuff like the Lord and how he's there for you like Lazarus you know I was thinking that when I was getting up to do my testimony like I don't really know what to say or anything so like Jesus said Lazarus you know come forth like out of the dead and there he is like that's how we gotta be we just gotta raise from that dead that's the end of my testimony. I don't want to talk about that. Thanks. Come on, Lance. Come on, Lance. Uh, my testimony is I started on drugs when I was uh, 17 years old. Um, before that, my sister sort of took me to church once. So I uh, it was Harvest Christian Fellowship, you know, great glory. So I had an idea of sort of what church was. I knew that I liked it, but I didn't sort of didn't follow up. As far as, but I did go forward when I was when I was little. So uh, I just remembered that that church experience. Um, but I got hooked on methamphetamine when I was uh, 17 years old. I hung out with older people, basically in a garage all the time for years and years, and uh, it it did ruin my life at a young age. Uh, and I continued on with that. I hung out with my friends and that went on to college. A lot of them became doctors, some, you know, some of them lawyers and but me I took the wrong turn and uh just kind of went on a downhill, but I was a car salesman and that kind of uh that kind of fed my addiction because I was able to go to work and do that and and sort of uh drink and and while I worked. So you know, I didn't go to prison like a lot of people did because of uh, basically the car sales job. I would, uh, I just, I would go to work every day, and my friends did basically what I did at the dealership. That's who I hung out with, and you know, we'd go out after and that sort of thing. But uh, you know, one day I was in the garage, and uh, we were all, you know, I was still with older people, and the guy, I, you know, I was starting to wonder who Jesus was and kind of had questions about that. But uh, 
So this guy tells me, oh, you know, are, are you a Christian? I think, well, you know, yeah, I, I believe. But I, he's, well, are you born again? And I knew that I wasn't a born again Christian. I knew of God, but I didn't, you know, I knew I wasn't what that was. So uh, that started, I started to think after that, you know, and I started to think, you know, who, who is Jesus? Is he, like, these are things I know about him, but I know I don't personally know him. So from there, uh, I just started having more questions and had uh, wanted to know who Jesus was. And uh, I don't know what happened next, but I found myself at Harvest Christian Fellowship again. Um, oh, I know what happened. I, I lived at home. I don't want to go on and on, but I lived, I lived with my parents till an old, old age basically. And uh, so my aunt, you know, she's a Mormon. Not, I'm not putting down the Mormons tonight, but uh, she said, kick him out of the house. And so I was at the Salvation Army trying to drink enough water to whatever their test was at a gas station. Uh, and finally, I went in there and they let me in. I didn't pass, but they still let me in. And that kind of you know, that kind of showed me what, you know, a little bit of what going to church was. And although I didn't like it there, but from there, we, we used to go to Harvest Christian Fellowship again. So, um, but I liked that church and I, I liked the preaching and it was, you know, it really, it touched my heart. I came forward there again. And uh, from there, uh, you know, I got saved and I started going to the men's studies. Uh, for seven years I did that. I went to the men's study. I called it the double shot because I went on Tuesday to that, and then Wednesday I served in the parking lot ministry. Um, and uh, so that was Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I went to church on and after. And then Sunday morning at 7.30 I went to church. So I did that for seven years, and uh, in the middle I had a mess up. But So... Uh, but after that, you know, I had friends in the church and I got to know people and I hung out and it was really, uh, I didn't do anything as far as being a drunk or my former life. I didn't like hang out with any of those people. I just, so somehow I was working at a Kia dealership and next thing you know, I was, I had a fall and I was out in my car. They'd call, there was an up list technology had it so that I would be on the screen. We didn't have to go out there and call blue. You know, we didn't have to do that no more. So it, it would be on my phone. Okay, I'm up next. So anyway, not to glamorize it because there was no glamour to it. I was drinking in my car till I got the next customer. But that didn't work for very long. They found the, the, the beer cans. And um, so I had a buddy from Harvest. He told me, well, you should go to U-Turn for Christ. And I thought, that's what I don't need to do, you know. <laughs> that's what I was thinking, you know. And uh, But sooner or later, I thought I would do anything to get my relationship with Jesus back. And so I thought, okay, and the next thing you know, my dad's driving me to U-turn, and they get my luggage out of the, the car and walk in. And so, and I didn't, you know, I, I would like to say the first time worked, and it didn't. I've kind of bumped my head, but uh, here I am, and uh, you know, the Lord's given me strength, hope, courage, all those things. I'm walking in the newness of life, and one of the pastors told me, well, this time you're going to, and I, you know, I'm, I'm believing that I'm, I'm a new creation. I'm believing that, and for me, if I have to believe that because that's what the Bible says, and I'm believing what the Bible tells me, and uh, you know, thank you, Jesus. Thanks for listening to me. I thought you said you weren't ready to give your testimony. That was good. All right, I think we got one more in the back. Uh. 
you guys heard my testimony. My name is Bernardo. Uh, <clears throat> I come from a criminal uh, lifestyle. You know, that's, that's where I come from. You say you never made it to prison. I made it to prison. I did uh, 15 years in prison for kidnapping to commit robbery. I won't say the name, but I kidnapped my own friend. We had personal problems. Uh, they, they sent me to uh, life in prison in uh, January 23rd, in 2005. I was on my way to prison. Uh, and that's the lifestyle I knew, you know? I was comfortable. It hurt me, but I was comfortable. I said it before. Uh, you know, we, we talk about being feeling hopeless, you know, feelings of hopelessness. I know what that feels. You know, I know what it feels when you know that there's nothing that can get your done. And I felt that. Uh, I was uh, 19, almost 20. Uh, and, uh, man, I, I was blinded. I was callous. I was uh, blinded by hatred. Uh, there was a lot of things going on. And I took uh, pleasure in, in, in living that lifestyle. You know, some people get in trouble and... and, and, and when they, when they start reaping the consequences, you know, uh, they panic. I knew what I had coming, and I was okay with it. You know, it's sad to say that. And, and, and uh, it's one of my goals, go to prison, you know, uh, graduate, you know, from the street life and hopefully uh, do something in there. Uh, but it was sad. Uh, I left the kid behind. I left my, my ex at that time. And, uh, man, when I, when, I went, when I went to prison, uh, all I kept telling myself is, I'm going to do whatever it takes, you know, to always come on top. You know, I know it, it's vicious. I mean, the, um, I had a distant memory, uh, uh, a thought of ever getting out, you know, they sent me to life in prison. And I remember the, the judge told me that I was uh, incorrigible, you know, that uh, I deserved this, to spend the rest of my life in prison. Uh, at that time, I, I didn't understand it. Uh, I was still in denial about my behavior. In 2014, if I'm not mistaken, laws changed, and I, 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 didn't get, I didn't got to say it last time. So SB 260 and SB 261, meaning that if you were uh, tried as a juvenile, you know, they will give you a chance if you were never given a chance before. And all they did was convict you. And that's what they did. Uh, uh, violated my rights. Uh, uh, basically, they didn't give me a chance, but... Uh, and, <laughs> While I was in prison, I had no hopes of changing, okay? We talk about being comfortable in, in our sin. I was comfortable with who I was, you know? Uh, I thought I was somebody. <laughs> I thought I was important, you know, to something. Until I started go going to school, uh, started educating myself. I went to prison. With, I could barely read and write, you know? And that's, a, that's it's the truth, you know? And I started educating myself in prison. I got my GD. I went to college, and that helped me started helping me to see things outside the box, you know, but I was still blinded. I was, I was still uh, walking uh, spiritually dead. The Bible says that we used to walk in the council of the dead. And, and to me, what that means is that I was so completely submerged in my own depravity that there was no way I was going to reach out to God and say, hey, forgive me, help me. No, there was no way. I was so lost in my sin. So laws changed, going to college, I'm feeling a little bit better about myself. Uh, and I get a letter. Give me a letter, eh, Velasquez. You have a, a, a hearing. You, are, uh, you qualify for SB 260. So I look at the paper, and I remember one of my homies was with me. And I look at the paper, and I laugh. I ripped it, and I threw it away. I was like, man, they're going to let me go. So uh, 2018, uh, September 15, they released me from prison. I went to a hearing. I went to see a psychologist. Then I went to go see, I went to my board hearing, which is three two commissioners, and the DA. Uh, I think I had four and a half to five years clean uh, since 115. Some of you guys know what that is. And uh, it was my first hearing, and I didn't have an attorney. So um, I remember when I was in the holding tank, I was nervous, you know. I was nervous. Uh, and the only reason why I went was because uh, I wanted to start clean. I wanted to take responsibility, you know. Because I took it to trial, I lost. And I just wanted to take responsibility because my mother was getting old and she had had a stroke. And I was like, man, she's going to die. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to be there. I'm done. You know, I'm never getting out. So I was uh, working the steps, the 12 steps. So uh, I wanted to make uh, uh, take responsibility, which is, I think, is step five. It's been a long time. 
So I'm going to go in there and take responsibility. I admit, I admit it to God, so now I have to admit it to, to the board. And uh, so I go in there, and uh, they have like a public defender who comes and talks to you real quick. And he looked at me, and he was like, hey, Velasquez, uh, I have uh, good news and bad news. And I was like, okay, go ahead. And he's like, uh, the, the bad news is that you have a 2% chance of getting a date. So I was like, I wasn't, in, I wasn't going in there to get a date. I knew they were going to deny me at least seven years or 10, maybe. So, uh, <clears throat> and he tells me, uh, we have a new commissioner. I, re I still remember his name. His name is a commissioner grounds. He was a warden in uh, Salinas Valley, I think, at, uh, before. And then he became a, 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 a commissioner. So, and then uh, Commissioner Statson as well. So, uh, he tells me, you have a new commissioner, and every time we have a new commissioner, you know they want to make an example. So, my, my advice, uh, postpone your hearing for five years and come back later, and maybe you'll get a chance. And I told him, I said, look, man, I'm not here to get a date. They're not going to give me a date. I just want to take responsibility and go back to myself and keep doing what I'm doing. They're not going to let me get out. I'm too young. And I, I didn't care. I was comfortable. You know, I purposed in my heart that I was going to die in prison. So uh, um, so I, I went along with the hearing, and he's like, okay, it's your problem, not mine. So I went in there, and they're asking me harsh questions, you know. Uh, but before that, uh, I, went to my, uh, I went to my psych evaluation because I, I did too much time. And they want to know where we at, you know, we post a threat, and uh, I got a low. You know, and at that, I was at a yard where everybody was getting a, a high or moderate, and you got to get a low in order for them to consider you, to see you. So, uh, then uh, I remember going there, uh, Clarizio was her last name, and uh, she was a young psychologist, and she was getting everybody highs, everybody highs, and they were uh, following, uh, I think, uh, uh, what's that called? Uh, they were following a, uh, a petition to remove her. She was getting every life, for, she was giving every life for uh, uh, high evaluations, and they deny you. You go to the board, and they're gonna deny you like seven to 10 years, to 15 years. Some people got denied 15 years. Meaning, you, seven years have to pass by before they consider you again. So I went in there and I didn't know who she was until I saw her name and I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I was like, man, I'm, I'm cool. I'm not going home anyway. So I was just being honest. She was asking me harsh questions about my childhood and, you know, what happened. Woo, woo, woo. When was the first time you heard somebody? And I was just being honest, you know. And uh, then she gave me a low. So that, you know, Got my heart beating a little bit like, man, might happen. I don't know. So I went to my hearing, new commissioner, commissioner stats, and, and they're asking me hard, hard questions, you know. And I'm just, I'm being honest. I'm being brutally honest. And every time I will answer a question, uh, and I'm not going to say what they were asking me because I don't want to gl glorify it, but they want to know when was the first time I heard somebody, you know. And I share the story with some of you guys. The first time I ever heard somebody with the weapon, I was 14 years old, and that was my own homeboy. He was a bully. You know, and you, a lot of you guys know I'm a midget, you know, so you, you can imagine, you can imagine growing up, you know, I, I had a, I had a, I had a, you know, a challenge. So I learned to equalize a fight every time, you know, you guys, you guys know what I'm talking. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. So yeah, it was my own homeboy, uh, being a bully. I was the only one that was fighting them, younger generation and I stabbed him. Uh, and, uh, I was, I answered that way. And I remember commissioner. Grounds is looking at me, and he just went like this, like, and in my heart and in my mind, I'm thinking, man, these people think I'm a monster, you know, but they don't have, they don't have any idea how I grew up, so, and I'm just being honest, they're an you know, answering their questions, and they're just shaking their head, and I'm like, man, they're going to crucify me in here, they're going to give me like a 15-year denial, so, uh, towards my deliberation, they asked me if I have something to say, so, I had wrote something, a, a closing statement, so I gave my closing statement, and uh, the DA is uh, attacking me. You know, uh, he's going, oh, you know, Velasquez, we've seen uh, harsher stories or more crucial stories than yours. You're not the only one in the world that has gone through stuff like that. Uh, uh, you only have this much uh, uh, time clean, um, and because this and that, and I'm going to, you know, ask for, for a denial, you know. Uh, I don't think you're ready. Uh, I think you're full of it, whatever. And I was just taking it all in. I wanted to get out of there already. You know, I didn't want to be there. It was so emotionally overwhelming. You know, go, go through your past and your childhood and relieve certain things that you thought that they were gone. 
they're always there. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I go back out there for an hour. They're coming back in, and uh, they're deliberating. And I'm not even paying attention. I'm just thinking, man, I want to get out of here. I want to go back to myself, you know, kick back. So, uh, they, they, Mr. Commissioner, Commissioner Ground says, uh, you know what, Velasquez, uh, uh, we'll, we'll do to the, we'll whatever we call it, uh, today we find you suitable for parole. And I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it, you know. And uh, there was a the cop that was the car that was there. He knows me from the yard. Uh, and I remember he hit me. He's like, "Hey, did you hear him?" And I looked at him and I was like, "What? You got a date?" And I was like, "What?" And then they, they he picked me up and says, "We gotta we gotta take you back." So cuffed me up, took me back into the holding tank, and I'm and I'm pacing in the holding tank. And I was like, "Did I get it? No, he's he's playing with me, you know." And uh, so. The guard comes in, and when he comes in, we got to back up and put our hands behind our back. So I back up, and uh, he comes in, opens the door, and Commissioner Ground comes in, you know. And uh, <clears throat> he uh, extended his hand, and he pulled me. When I shook his hand, he pulled me, and he gave me a hug. Um, and, you know, he told me, congratulations. He said, uh, he said Velasquez, you're full of life, and uh, I'm going to give you a second chance. Don't waste it. And uh, he said, go create awareness. I'll never forget that. So, uh, you know, I grew up uh, hating uh, author law enforcement, everything that had to do with authority. I hated it. I rebelled against it, you know, bad experiences. And to have somebody like that come to me and give me a hug, it kind of restored hope in my life, you know, because my vision was ex extremely distorted and clouded by things that took place growing up, you know. So I had no trust, cops, judges, public pretenders, like you guys called them, all of that. And when he came and shook my hand and gave me a hug, and he was crying, you know, it gave me hope. So, you know, I got out, got out, started grinding, working, doing the right thing. You know, got my own place, bought me a car, was doing good, had money in the bank, you know. Uh, I was doing so good, man. I, I like to have things, you know. I like to have things. And back then, I used to hustle. And uh, uh, I started working and doing the right way. And, uh, too much stress. I wasn't ready for, for the, the challenges that I was going to face out here as a free man. You know, I was having a hard time programming. That's what we call it in there. So I couldn't program. Got into a relationship. It's too overwhelming. You know, too, a lot of emotions. And I wasn't ready to deal with that. You know, and I, I'm, I'm the type of person that I'll ignore somebody completely. You know, I don't need you. That's how I am. I don't need you. You know, I, I can fend for myself. So I was pushing people that care about me. Even I was in a relationship with uh, my, my ex. So it didn't work out. I started using. I met some of my homeboys, ran into some of my, homeboy, my ex homeboys. And, uh, you know, come on, hey, hit this or here, sniff this, whatever. And, uh, I already knew, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm crazy as it is already. So I started using meds and drinking. But, you know, I had a problem. I wouldn't just, I wouldn't just use a little bit. I, I want to buy a whole bag and keep on drinking. You know, and every time I did that, I would go back to all of that. Somebody was, you were, t you were talking about insanity. Man, I'm insane when I'm high. You know, there's murder in my heart. There's all kinds. Got caught up in a, a sexual perversion, you know. Uh, uh, for all of that. You know, drug addiction. Uh, uh, um, even though I was still working, my life started becoming unmanageable. I couldn't control it. I tried to commit suicide a few times. I bought a gun. I went back to my neighborhood. They don't, they don't want you there. When they don't want you, they don't want you there. You know, but that's how stubborn and stupid I was. You know, in my head, I was like, well, it is what it is. Let's do it. And um, a friend of mine came to pick me up. And as we're driving to L.A., I, I had a 380, and I pulled it under my seat. And I pulled the seat back. I tell you guys a story. And I cocked it. And I was going to shoot I was gonna shoot myself here under, under my, uh, my, uh, my jaw. And I remember my homeboy snatched it, and he lectured me, you know. How we lecture each other. He's like, man, kill somebody. Don't kill yourself. That's how, that's the insanity. That's how we think. You know, Just don't go out like that. Kill somebody. Don't kill yourself. And uh, I didn't want to hurt nobody no more. I was done. I was feeling hopeless. Uh, 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 it was hard for me to, uh, to program. I felt like freedom or the, the world, the outside world was not for me. That's how I felt. That's how I truly felt. Man, this is not for me. People are too complicated. You know, they cry too much. They complain. You know, they don't know, they, they, they don't have respect boundaries. But that's how institutional I was in my head, you know. Um, so when I was in prison, 
going to Calipatria in the hall, there's a preacher who used to pass by, you know. And I remember I was doing burpees. I was a kid at that time. I was doing burpees. And he went and knocked at my door. And I, and I looked out the window. And I, he had some pamphlets. And he looked at me and he was like, what's up, young man? Can, is there something I can do for you? And I looked at him. That was going to be disrespectful. I already had it in my head. And I looked at him and I told him, uh, yeah, yeah, you can. I told him, can you, can you let me out? And he's like, well, I can't do that. And then I kicked my door hard. I told him, get, get off my door, man. You can't help me. Get off my door. And um, I kept his pamphlets and I read them. Then I threw them away. But I read them. And when I read them, you know, I felt the Lord uh, tugging at my heart. But I reject the message, you know. I, I share with some of you guys. I haven't shared this part of my testimony, and uh, I picked up the word, I read it, but when I felt that that tug in my heart, I threw it away because I, I wasn't ready, you know, and uh, it was a sign of weakness for me to do that, you know, uh, so I got out, and I remember, and uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to go to church, because I was so overwhelmed with everything that was happening, and I needed help, and I didn't know how to ask for help, I thought I did, but I didn't. So I went to church. Uh, I ended up getting a, a place. Uh, uh, it's funny. Uh, two blocks away from there, there was a church. And I always used to see it when I used to drive with my car coming from work. So I walked in there one day. And so I walked in the church. I sat down. And, and that preacher, uh, preaching with boldness, you know. Uh, I call it fire and brimstone. You know, I always like somebody that brings a message raw and uncut. Don't sugarcoat nothing to me, you know. That's the way I was brought up. And, uh, man, he was talking, he was saying some harsh things, and I couldn't stay there. The whole sermon, I would leave, you know. And I kept thinking, somebody is telling him things about me, you know. He, you know, somebody here knows me because he's, and I could swear he was looking at me. You know, uh, I'll never forget Pastor Torres. Uh, he said, uh, he said uh, it doesn't matter how, mu how much you run. You know, you're going to end up being like Jonah. And I was familiar with that because I have a photographic memory. I can read something and it'll stay in my head. And uh, I was like, man, I thought he was talking about me. You think you can run or you can't run away from the presence of God? And I left again. And I was sharing with Arnold, I always run. That's what I do. So uh, I left. I went back in there again. I left. I went back in there. I couldn't stay there. And uh, I met out. I saw one of my old homeboys in there. And he didn't even recognize me because I was a little kid. And uh, he didn't know who I was. And he was a Christian. I mean, oh, God. And so the whole time, God has convicted me. Convicted me so hard. I, I, I don't want to stay in the sermon. So finally, I made that choice. And I said, you know what? I'm done. We're going to do this. So I went in there. Talked to the pastor. I accepted the Lord. Uh, they, uh, I got baptized. And it got even worse for me. It was like, we talk about spiritual warfare. I was going through it. It got so intense for me. So intense for me that I even, uh, I try to, I try to uh, commit suicide. I, I met my, I got to meet my biological father. I never met my biological father up, up here in Hood River and came to meet him. Things got a little shaky between me and him. Um, I left. By that time, they had brought this guy to talk to me at the church where I got baptized. Because uh, they know where I was coming from. And, and the whole church, they were like, uh, uh, they were in the military, law enforcement, and I was the only hoodlum in there. And I was like, man, what am I doing here? You know, I don't belong in a place like this. This is not a place for me. And the enemy was attacking me. He's like, you see, you don't belong here. What are you doing here? So they brought this guy named Mike Knox. And we started talking, hanging out. So I ended up leaving California to be my dad. Things didn't work out. I make my way down there. But at that time, he had told me about a program. And he says, hey, Bernie, you need to go to a program to get better, you know, because uh, you're, you're getting overwhelmed because you haven't been out here in a long time. And I felt disrespected because I was like, man, you're trying to send me to a program, and I just finished doing 15 years, and you're trying to send me back to prison. I'm going to go there. What's wrong with you? I can fix it myself. But um, anyhow, I, I did not heed his advice, so I left, ended up in Hood River, and I uh, left there, too. I left all my belongings up there with my dad and uh, made my way. I was ma making my way to California. I ended up in a hotel. I'm drinking, you know. When, whenever we want to find uh, uh, drugs, we always find a way. And so I found a way. I stayed in a hotel, I think, for a week. And uh, I met a tomahawk. 
A tomahawk is you, you break your razor, right? And you tape it up when you're in prison to cut somebody. And I made one and I, I was cutting up, you know, because I, I was drunk and I was like, I'm done. So I cut, I cut up a few times, but I was so drunk I passed out. So uh, um, I woke up the next day, my, my hand was, was bleeding and, and man, God is merciful, you know. And so I woke up and one of the brothers that I got real close to, uh, Jason, sent me a text that morning. When I was barely waking up and I started cleaning the blood. And he said, uh, uh, he said, you're heavy in my heart, brother. I'm praying for you. And uh, at that time, you know, I felt that conviction. I started crying. I started asking the Lord to help me. You know, and, and I just I just cried out to him. I said, man, if you don't help me, I'm going to blow my head. You know, and uh, like I was telling Pastor Kevin earlier, I told him, if you help me, if you take all this away, you know, and, and truly make me a new creation, I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. And um, so I remember with the... Uh, Mike Knox had said, he says, go to a program. So I started looking for a program. And uh, I remember U-Turn popped up and Mike had told me about U-Turn. So when I saw U-Turn, I was like, man, Mike, tell me about that program. And that's when I called. That's when I called the pastor. And uh, I've been here. I left again, but I came back because uh, the Bible says that he who lives in us is stronger than he who lives in this world. Yeah. Um, you know, no matter what happens, I know that the conviction of the Spirit of God is always going to be there in my heart, you know. Uh, and He's the one that brought me back. He's been merciful to me. Uh, my life verse is Galatians 2.20, you know. For I have been crucified with Christ. You know? uh, it is no longer I who live. And in the life that I live in the flesh, I live through faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know? So I've, I've learned to put everything to the side. Uh, when I came to Utah, the Lord was telling me, this is the verse that the Lord gave me. It's funny. He says, be still. I know that I'm God. Be still. And that's, that, that has been the strongest thing for me, to be still, humble myself, and stop thinking that I have all the answers. Because I, uh, I have always been self-reliant, you know. I depend on myself. I grew up in the streets. So uh, I've learned to depend you know, on my maker. And uh, I've learned to understand that uh, he is a provider. You know, he's been there for me. Even when I was a little kid, he never, he was, he never let me go. I wouldn't be here. So God is amazing. I'm grateful. Uh, and you know I love you, Lord. And yeah, I'm going to serve you. Thank you, guys. So all of those have one thing in common, and, and it's a, you know, I was thinking of a verse that kind of covered all of those different testimonies. You know, and it's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our tra trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You know, that's all of our lives, right? Um, if it wasn't for the but God, you know, we were doing whatever, but God, who's rich in his mercies, you know, uh, saved us from our, our filth and our muck. And part of the story that I like about... Uh, Bernardo's testimony is how how much God was working in this for years and years and years and years. And so the Mike Knox that he was talking about lives in Southern California, where he met him. He was in Oregon, of course, when when you know he uh, came here. Well, Mike Knox, I happened to coach in Southern California in football from the time he was little, and so. You know, he's telling him about U-Turn for Christ, and he ends up at our U-Turn for Christ. Like I said, I knew Mike Knox since he, he was little. He played football with my nephews and stuff. So this whole time, uh, you know, God was putting all these circumstances in place, and he ended up here. You know, and it just shows how the mercy and the uh, how far God will chase after us, you know, to, to deliver us from our sins, you know, in all of these stories, you know. Um, reaching people under bridges and, and you know, just poor choices and everything else we do, you know. Um, although, thank God, as his word says, you know, where sin abounds, his grace abounds much more, right? And so no matter how far we try to run from God's grace, no matter how far we try to run from his calling in our lives, you can't do it. You know, you are eventually going to get puked up on the shores of Nineveh, like, uh, you know, Bernard was saying. And as far as, you know, he will, he will, you can't outrun God. 
And so, you know, if your life is tired, if you're tired of it, then quit running. You know, as I preached on Wednesday, and as he quoted Psalm 46.10, you know, be still and know that he is God and let him do the rest. So, so now that we've done all of this, we left Tyson about three minutes to preach. So uh, I'll invite Pastor Tyson up to give his message. Or... to Luke 5, just for a minute. You know what amazes me all week long, just as I dealt with different things, as I picked out a psalm to be in, the Lord was just kind of throughout the week kind of ministering to me, and, uh, just reminding, teaching, encouraging me to slow down, you know, that the battle belongs to Him. And uh, <laughs> because I'm like many of you this evening, you know, I chose to listen to rather than listening and trusting the Lord, right? Which oftentimes the Lord will give us a word just like our brother said, but rather than trusting that word, we tend to lean back on our own understanding of the gospel and our own understanding. And so I kind of ignored it and I uh, really probably took the opposite end where I studied in depth, you know, in this whole time, the Lord saying, Tyson, be still, I'm going to fight for you. It, you know, and then all throughout the week, it, it was just this constant reminder that the battle belongs to the Lord. That so often we get ahead of him and we, you know, we take life and we grab it and we say, hey, seize the day. This moment is mine. And the Lord says, no, hey, Hey, no, it's never been. And so Luke 5, and I just want to read it out. And this, this wasn't the passage, Luke 5. Let's pick it up in verse 12. It reads, while he, Jesus, was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he charged him, tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him, to be healed of their sicknesses. But he, Jesus, would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And so as we close out, I just want to at this moment invite anyone uh, to kind of hang out afterwards. I will have some fellowship or if you need prayer to just come up and receive prayer. But I went to this text because oftentimes I believe, you know, what I love is this text, it doesn't really tell us who this man was. It doesn't tell us anything about him, you know, but just studying or just looking at it, you know, I kind of can only help but think, you know, maybe this man was a father. Maybe this man was a husband. Maybe this man had brothers or siblings. You know, in, the, in that day, if you're not aware, lepers, they were not allowed within the camp. They were casted out. And whenever they would have to come in, they'd yell unclean, unclean to the point uh, these men, these individuals were so rejected that even the religious leaders of the day would mock them and throw stones at them. And so you're talking about someone who's really alone. I think the leper kind of uh, tops the cake in the sense that they lived their whole life outside that contact. They lived their whole life. But here's the kicker. I think that many of us are just like that leper where we're desiring to be made clean. We're desiring to see the Lord move, but rather than coming to the what does it say? It says, I will. God's heart is always to heal. God's heart is always to restore. And yes, we will answer for the life we live. Yes, we will give an account to God. If you are in sin this evening, I promise you, just as we've heard tonight, that your sin will find you out. Even if it doesn't come in this life, the next life you will give an account to God for your life and you will answer for the life you live. For every word spoken and every choice made, you will give an account and you will give back to God and answer to God. But in these things, there's mercy and there's grace. Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. And so I don't know about you guys, but I know that I relate to that leper oftentimes feeling that I am beyond the grace of God, feeling that, beyond, that I'm beyond the love and the mercy of God. Let me encourage you, 
No one. If you can get a doctor, an outlaw, and a kid who can barely tie his shoes in the same room, man, that's nothing short of a miracle. People say miracles don't happen today. Oh, I take a look around this room. I say miracles exist today. That this evening, all of us gathered, it is the hand of God that has brought these things about. So my encouragement is brief but clear. Trust in the Lord, and he will lead you all the way. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. And so, Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just thank you for tonight. God, I, I thank you, God, how you just take lead. God, how we can have our own plans and ideas God, and even as I was so bent on what I felt you wanted to share, God, you just had a whole other plan. God, it amazes me. God, you go beyond all our abilities of understanding. God, we, we love you. We thank you. If anyone's listening online or anyone in here this evening that doesn't know you, God, we confess our need of a Savior. God, we confess our sins and we confess the fact that without you, Jesus Christ, we are lost and forsaken. God, but through, God, your Son, through the blood of our precious Savior, God, all of us stand on solid ground. In Jesus Christ, we place our trust. All other ground is sinking ground. God, we ask you into our hearts. God, we pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins and teach us how to live. God, I pray if there's anyone in here this evening that's just been maybe in a moment of sin or resisting you. Jesus, you are greater than every temptation. Jesus, you are greater than every trouble. Jesus, you are greater than all the trials we face. And so for the sick at home, and the ones who feel forsaken, God, for the ones who feel drowned out. God, we pray a special blessing. God, we love you. We thank you. We ask that you just keep us safe as we drive home in fellowship. God, we love you and just ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Stick around for fellowship.